little over 10,000 years ago, mankind first domesticated cattle. At this exact same time, cattle domesticated us. Our two species have worked together and taken care of each other for centuries. Zoetis is today's advanced answer to that ancient bond. We help make it stronger, healthier, more robust. We are born of the bond. Welcome to the panel discussion titled Genetic Strategies for Sustainability. Um, prior to introducing the speakers today and introducing the topic, I want to first thank our sponsor, Zoetis. Um, they strategically partner with a lot of dairymen to really help these genetic strategies come to fruition. Um, so my name is Brian Welly. I am a veterinarian and herd manager for Fiscalini Farms in Modesto, California. Um, there I get to work with a great team of employees and also a really great herd of cows, um, which are all genetically selected. Um, previously, prior to working full time at Fiscalini, um, I worked at Mid Valley Large Animal Service, where I got to work with a lot of other great dairymen, um, one of which is on our panel today, Simon Vanderwoude. Um, I received my bachelor's degree from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I'm a proud Mustang. Um, and then I subsequently went to UC Davis to study animal genomics with Dr. Allison Van Enenim, um, who's going to be on our panel today as well, and ultimately received my veterinary degree from UC Davis as well. Um, so genetic strategies for sustainability, we've got to hear from um, a lot of great uh, new technologies and um, people developing um, really ways to help our industry become more sustainable. Uh, this is a technology that's been around for over a decade that a lot of dairymen are using extensively. And um, really what it's doing is by genetically selecting our cows to be um, more production efficient and um, have improved um, fertility and production efficiency, we can reduce our environmental footprint and that's mainly by producing more with less. So in turn, we're helping the dairymen and we're also um, helping the industry at large. Um, some preliminary life cycle analyses looking at uh, comparing genetically superior herds to herds that are, um, that are less superior in terms of the numbers of genomics, um, it really shows a big difference in sustainability. Um, so we'll have the opportunity today to learn from um, Dr. Allison Van Enenim. She's going to be discussing uh, genomics with us and teaching us a little bit about genomics and then going and discussing how that impacts sustainability. And um, subsequently, we'll be hearing from two California dairy farmers who are utilizing this technology and how it's impacted um, both their farms and how they feel that impacts their environmental footprint for the industry. Um, so Dr. Allison Van Enenim, she's a professor of cooperative extension in the field of animal genomics and biotechnology from the Department of Animal Science at, she received her bachelor's in Melbourne, Australia, and then came to the U.S. and received both her master's and PhD at UC Davis. Um, her research focuses on animal genomics and biotechnology and livestock production systems. She's currently working on genome editing approaches in livestock. Um, she's a passionate scientist and has received prestigious awards in the field and has given over 700 invited presentations globally. Um, Brian Fiscalini is CEO of Fiscalini Farmstead, which includes both, both Fiscalini Farms and cheese companies. He's a fourth generation dairy farmer from uh, Modesto, California, and he's also my boss and is uh, an awesome dairyman. Um, Brian received his bachelor's degree from Cal Poly and his MBA from UOP. Um, prior to coming home to his family farm, he got to work as an intern at Fair Oaks Dairy Farms in northern Indiana and central Wisconsin, um, where he really had ideas to come back and bring to his family farm. Fiscalini Farms is a, has a long history of sustainability 
Um, they have been utilizing a methane digester since 2009 and have been utilizing genomics since 2011. Simon Vanderwoude. So Simon and his wife, Christine, own and operate three dairies in Merced County. Um, Simon serves as chairman of the board of CDI, California Dairies Incorporated, and, as well as serving on the board of several national and local um, organizations. Solar in 2014, so they also have a long history of sustainability. They believe that sustainability must be economically beneficial and mutually advantageous to the dairy and the environment, which I think we would all agree is a key component to sustainability. The Vanderwoudes have been utilizing genomics for strategic breeding since 2012. Um, so we're going to get into this discussion. I'm going to ask um, each panelist one individual question, then we're going to open it up to a group discussion. I'm going to start with Dr. Allison Van Enenim. Um, so Allison, can you please provide some background on the topic of genomics and how this technology can improve environmental sustainability? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be on this uh, panel. You've got previous bosses and current bosses here, so uh, that's a, a difficult situation to be in. And it's my pleasure <clears throat> to talk about the importance of genetics and genomics to the sustainability of, of um, dairy cattle production. And I really do, I realize I'm a geneticist, but I really do think that the genetic improvement of our food species is one of the major um, drivers of sustainability in food production. And I think that there's an intersection between um, some of the advanced genomic technologies, some of the assisted reproductive technologies and biotechnologies to synergistically accelerate our rate of genetic gain. And so I'm gonna give just a little background as to what genomics is for perhaps some of the people uh, that are attending this that, that genetics isn't their uh, main main gig, and um, I just I think if we look at the um, productivity or the efficiencies of dairy cattle production system over times, we can see these inflection points where new breeding methods have been introduced, and this shows the inflection point that was enabled by the implementation of artificial insemination back in the 1940s. That enabled much better bulls to be distributed more widely. And as a result, we got an acceleration in the rate of genetic improvement in average milk yield per cow. And I think we've probably seen several um, discussions of the fact that if you have more milk per cow, then effectively you reduce the overall environmental impact of a glass of milk. This is a, a kind of an iconic study from Jude Kappa showing um, that the US milk production today is about a third of a greenhouse gas um, impact that it was back in the 1940s. Um, and more generally, I think California has a similar story in the last 50 years where I think the greenhouse gas per glass of milk has decreased by about 45%. And about half of that is actually due to genetics. Uh, and that's why I think it's such an important topic to have at a sustainability discussion. And I guess the rate of genetic gain really depends upon these four components of what's called the breeder's equation. And the breeder's equation says your rate of genetic change per year, and of course, genetic change towards what is a really important aspect of that. So what are you selecting for? Um, not only the most productive animal, but hopefully also a very fertile animal, a healthy animal, an animal that's going to have longevity is all driven by these four components of the breeder's equation. So how accurately you can ascertain the very best animals to be parents of the next generation, how intensely you can use the very best genetics, such as bulls, the most elite bulls, for example, that's pretty much what artificial insemination does. What genetic variation or useful genetic traits you can bring into your breeding population. And then all of that is over this generation interval. That is the average age of parents when their offspring are born. And basically, because that's a denominator, the younger you are when your offspring are born, the more rapidly you can um, basically alter the rate of genetic improvement. And that's really where kind of genomics comes in. So genomic selection really gives you a bit of a look at who got lucky in the roulette of Mendelian sampling. So if we look at the picture on the left, that's kind of how genetics works. And I know we can consider a cow and a bull and maybe a group of flush mates there. They've all, before looking at them, have 
the uh, approximately same genetic value because we know what mum and dad are like. But if anyone's got offspring with their same partner, you'll know that they don't all come out the same. And that's because you get a different sampling of alleles from mum and dad with every individual. And basically what genomic selection enables you to do is have a look under the hood of the genetic inheritance of each animal and pick the one that got really lucky in Mendelian sampling. That is, it got good alleles for everything from mum and dad relative to all its full sibs. And that's the one you want to take forward to be the parent or the bull in this case of the next generation. And that's what's happened in the dairy industry since the adoption of genomic selection in 2009, which is not that long ago. What you can see in this graph with generation interval on the left is that the blue line there, the sires of bulls, the average age of the sires of bulls used to be about eight years. And that's because they had to go through progeny testing to basically have daughters to work out how good their milk production potential was. Once you had genomic selection, you could just look at the alleles they inherited and using genomic prediction equations, you could accurately predict young bulls who were going to be genetically superior. And that precipitously dropped the generation interval of both the, well, particularly the sires of bulls. And what that has done has actually doubled the rate of genetic improvement. And in this case, I'm using the index of net merit since the adoption of genomic selection. So we've doubled the rate of genetic improvement in the dairy cattle population in the United States. This is on a net merit basis. And I think a really important thing to consider is what is the index that you're rushing towards? In other words, if you're going very quickly with a quick rate of genetic gain, are you going in the right direction? Are you actually heading towards a more profitable index? And these indexes that are shown here are the classic USDA indexes. And for those of you that aren't familiar, the blue one there, net merit, is kind of an average index. The orange is fluid merit. That's for people that are really targeting a fluid market. Cheese merit is in gray and uh, grass merit is GM dollar. And what you can see, if you just look at, for example, the, the relative weighting of how much importance is put on fluid milk volume, if your fluid milk index is what you're getting paid for, then you put a lot of emphasis on volume of milk as the orange bar that goes all the way up to, what, 22% of the emphasis in the in the uh, fluid milk index versus if you're targeting a cheese merit index, you'd actually like them just to plop out a block of cheese. You really don't want any liquid. So you put a negative emphasis on there and you can see the relative weightings there as you go down, depending upon the relative importance of the different traits there, not only production traits, health traits, reproduction traits. And then very importantly, I think is fourth from the bottom is this health trait sub index, which in the USDA indexes is somewhere with a weighting of around about one to two percent of the relative emphasis and I think it's important to look at that relative to some of the other indexes that are being offered for example the um, uh, dairy wellness profit index that's offered by Zoetis which is shown as the orange uh, block there there's the dairy wellness index there's the wellness trait index and the calf wellness index and I think it's really important to compare compare and contrast, the net merit out of the USDA puts about 1.2% emphasis on health traits. Whereas you can see the Zoetis um, Dairy Wellness Profit Index, there's about, what is that, a quarter of the emphasis is on cow wellness and calf traits, calf wellness traits, about a third on production, and then an even split between fertility, function, and longevity. And I think it's important to understand the, the different drivers of these indexes because it's really producers that select, well, which is the index that I think makes the most sense for my particular operation and for the market that I'm pursuing. And it's important to be uh, genetically improving in the right direction. So hopefully um, that gives you a bit of an idea of how genomics is being used. It's an incredibly successful technology. It's been adopted. And I think last year there was a million genomic tests performed on commercial female dairy cows. And that's because producers are using it not only to select who's going to be parents of the next generation, but also maybe which heifers aren't going to be kept and maybe which heifers are going to be bred not with actual um, dairy semen, but with beef semen to produce an F1. And I think that's a really interesting market that's been enabled by the intersection of sex semen, genomic testing, and has resulted in this beef on dairy index. I'm going to finish there to let the producers uh, say how they're using these technologies in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. I'm 
appreciate your feedback there and, and showing the audience and, and teaching them a little bit about genomics. It's, it's helpful to learn that breeder's equation and certainly helpful to think about where we're taking it because obviously we're making rapid genetic gain and we want to take it in the right direction for each dairy. So um, with that, I'm going to ask each of the dairymen, we're actually going to start with the same question. So I'm going to start with Brian and can you tell us how you have utilized genomics in your herd for herd improvement? Sure. So, um, you know, we began genomic testing fairly early on uh, when it became commercially available with Zoetis. And initially, we, we got into genomic testing more out of curiosity. Um, we like to be on the, on the leading edge and, and pretty progressive in the, in the dairy industry. So we were curious about what we could do with this information. Um, and, you know, really the things that we were focusing on at the time is we were trying to figure out who the elite animals uh, in our herd were and if, you know, the results from those genomic tests actually correlated with uh, how they were performing, you know, in real life on the farm. So um, to answer how we're utilizing genomics today, uh, we're continuing to progress the herd, uh, maximize milk production, components, uh, longevity, fertility, uh, and overall health of the animal um, is, is really the areas that we continue to focus on. And um, we're just continue to be along for the ride as more, um, more genomic information becomes available and we can really dial in uh, the precision of, of uh, modern agriculture and produce ultimately what we're all trying to do is just produce a very healthy and wholesome uh, dairy products for the consumers. Thank you, Brian. Um, it, it has been interesting in um, both my experience with working with producers as a veterinarian and um, also in school seeing that most, most dairymen when, when adopting this technology certainly um, go through the process of, of figuring out how much they can trust the technology. And um, I think I've, I've seen that very few dairymen have decided to not continue um, utilizing it after going through that process. So um, it's an important process, but it, it seems like the, the technology is, is continuing to be utilized. Um, so Simon, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you the same question about how you've utilized uh, genomics in, in your herd for herd improvement. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, we've been testing with, uh, we've been doing genomics since 2012, uh, as you mentioned earlier. Um, it was like Brian, we like to be on the leading edge, maybe not the bleeding edge, but the, you know, kind of out front of, of being a progressive operation. Um, and uh, uh, it was out of necessity and, and we surrounded ourselves with a lot of really smart people that helped us start down the road and, and get in with a plan. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, why should we genomic test? And I said, well, if you're not going to do anything with it, don't do it. But if you have a plan, uh, it is a it is a very strategic tool to be used uh, in a breeding strategy and a repro plan uh, on, a, on a dairy. So we got we started doing it um, because I had been in constant growth mode for 20 near nearly 20 years. Uh, we grew from 150 cows to 3200 cows and and we had 3500 heifers at the time and and I was looking at it and going this is not sustainable. We don't need you know 3500 heifers. Uh, in our operation, and and so we sat down with a team from uh, Zoetis and Genex, and and uh, came up with a plan on how to uh, use genomics, uh, and then use that data to strategically breed uh, the right animals um, to the right semen, and and uh, that plan continues to progress over the last ten years, and um, so we we have really stri strived to create more healthy, um, longer lasting cows uh, for our herd, uh, which enables us to. I think we're at like 78% heifers to cows or something like that. So, um, you know, we've been pretty strategic about uh, not feeding any more heifers than what we need. Uh, some of the traits we really focus on are uh, DPR, uh, net merit, dairy wellness profit dollars, um, combined fat and protein. We're generally selling into a butter powder market. So uh, those, those are uh, important to us. Um, 
and as time goes, it has it can't be such a rigid program that it it can't flex. Um, so we, you know, when we started, we really focused on DPR and forgot about everything else. Uh, what that ha what happened then is, you know, we used a lot of high DPR sires that ne didn't necessarily have a lot of milk. So we saw it in our heifers coming out a year and a half later that oh man, there's no milk in these animals, and so we've we've learned that you have to kind of um, look at the composite, you know, use the composite scores. Um, be strategic about uh, the bulls you're using. Uh, so we, we strive to create a, a kind of a smaller animal uh, that will last longer, uh, be more feed efficient and uh, um, put more pounds of solids um, into that milk truck every day. And so we can haul less water away and, and haul more uh, solids away, which is what we get paid for. Um, so a lot of health traits that we focus on and uh, I think we've, we've definitely uh, reaped the rewards of uh, a lot of that breeding over the last 10 years as well. And um, it doesn't mean there's no health problems on our dairy. Trust me, I, I milk the hospital every morning, so I know that th that still exists. But I will say that uh, they are, uh, they're minimized compared to what, what they used to be. And um, that's in combination with environment, um, facilities, uh, labor, you know, training, following protocols, all, the, all those things factor in, but genomics have definitely been a big part of uh, our operation uh, excelling over the last um, 10, 15 years. Thank you, Simon. Um, it was excellent. And uh, I know you mentioned some specific traits that uh, Allison had brought up in, the, in some of her slides. And um, so I just want to bounce this back to Allison. Um, and in your experience, Allison, um, when dairymen discuss both using genomic indices for selection and then also discuss uh, maybe, I'm going to call it pigeonholing, but going down the road of, of maybe selecting a little bit too hard on an individual trait, um, as Simon alluded to with DPR and then having the cows come in with less milk, um, can you expand a little bit on how these uh, genetic indices and genomic indexes are established? Sure. Well, I, I have to thank Simon for that beautiful example. So single trait selection is uh, often associated with unwanted correlated traits. And I think we saw that early or when we didn't used to have fertility um, traits in the indexes, uh, there was a lot of production, but that came at the cost of fertility. And so ultimately, it's like all things in life. You want a little bit of everything and, and it should be in balance and it should be heading in a direction that's associated with with your particular operation sales. So Simon alluded to the fact that they get paid for solids. So he'd probably like a cow that blopped out a blob of cheese. So would Brian probably. Um, but then you also have to also have a fertile cow. And so the, there's genetic correlations that are all worked in there. And the relative weightings of the different traits are based on kind of, they're driven by economics at the back of it um, that says, you know, if a daughter pregnancy increase of 1% is worth a certain amount of money versus a certain amount of product, what's the relative weighting that makes the most sense and is going to produce the economically optimal offspring? And that's basically what those indexes are expressed in is, is dollar profit of offspring of that animal um, for that particular market, whichever that might be. And so to me, it's a kind of an easy way to to rank bulls. Um, maybe then, you, you, you know, so I've seen producers will rank them and then maybe they'll have a, a truncated number in terms of, I, I'm not going to take daughter pregnancy less than X, but I'll take the top net merit up until that point. And so you can kind of play with it a little bit, but the, the index is really designed to give you a composite score that's, it's, it's money ball basically, right? It's giving you the composite score for those animals um, in with all of the traits considered simultaneously. Perfect. Um, so Brian, I know that um, herd longevity, productive life, that's uh, not something that, that you mentioned just previously, but I know that that's something that, that you focus on. Can you allude to um, your selection of that and how you feel that improves um, sustainability of your operation? Sure, so similar to um, Simon's example of heifer to cow ratio, um, obviously, there's a lot of ways that you can you can reduce that. 
Um, you can simply just go out and sell a bunch of heifers, uh, but you, you've got to have a plan as to how you're going to maintain your herd size and, and keep the right number of animals coming through your barn. So longevity is obviously uh, probably along with fertility, the, the two most important um, traits, I believe that, that will help you get that heifer to cow ratio um, in a better balance, if that is what you're striving for. Um, and I think we're all, you know, you, you've got to look at that, that heifer crop and that population as a, as a cost center. It, it is an investment, but it's also a cost center. And the fewer number of animals that you have on your, on your farm or in your herd that are not producing revenue, you know, that's a, that's a better business model. Um, so if you can have more animals that are producing revenue compared to less animals that are not, I think that's, um, economically, that's a smart decision. And then from a sustainability standpoint, obviously you're shipping more, more pounds of milk, um, compared to the number of heads that you're feeding. So there, there's a really remarkable uh, story to be told as to why that's important, uh, to have a have an animal in your herd that will last, you know, multiple lactations and produce multiple offspring. Um, and one of the Zoetis representatives that we use, uh, you know, that, that we utilize his expertise once told me, you know, there's really nothing more sustainable than the dairy cow herself. And the more offspring that she can produce in her life makes her even more sustainable. So um, I think that is really kind of drives home that whole idea of why longevity is important in our industry. Thanks, Brian. Simon, anything you want to add on that subject of longevity and um, productive life? No, I, I think, uh, you know, it has to go hand in hand with the environment that the cow is in and uh, the better environment we can, we can promote for uh, the cow and, and uh, her living conditions and, and the heifers as we raise them and, and colostrum management from the day they're born. Uh, all these things tie together. Um, so as we create, you know, as we strive to create healthier animals, uh, that doesn't take the onus off of us to do everything else that we need to do, uh, vaccination protocols and, and all the other things that still need to happen uh, for that animal. So. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely is the first step in, in giving that animal the best chance that they can, they can get on uh, lasting a long time in, in the herd. And so, um, yeah, and an animal that gets pregnant, you know, is going to inevitably usually last longer, you know, be a more profitable, longer lasting animal for, uh, for the dairy. Definitely. The intersection of genomics and management is, is hugely important. Um, Simon, can you um, elaborate on your OPU IVF program that, that you have? And um, Allison talked about intensity of genetic gain and also generation interval. And I think that that program addresses both of those for um, genomic selection. Sure. So um, when we started genomics, I mean, our, our main objective was to come up with a breeding strategy uh, for our herd that would get us uh, the right number of heifers. And, and we continue to implement that today. Um, and about five years ago, we started doing IVF. And so we identify uh, some of the, the best genetics that we think we have. And uh, we collect eggs off those animals, bring them to a lab and uh, make embryos. And then we bring the embryos back and place them in recipients in our herd. So um, again, we're kind of advancing that generation interval that Allison talked about. Um, that's, that's really the, the impetus for why we do what we do. Um, so today, um, about a quarter of the calves born are uh, embryos. And I know there's dairies. I talked to other dairymen around the country who, who do this and, and some are more aggressive, some are less aggressive. I'm kind of in the middle of the road, I think, as far as, uh, people that do this. Um, so we, we started out, um, kind of using the, the old dairyman way of thinking of, you know, that, that, ca that seventh, eighth, ninth lactation cow that, you know, just does her thing every single year. I'm going to make more of those. And so we started out doing IVF on only cows, um, you know, kind of a proven commodity. Um, but we saw, we just saw as Dr. Venom 
as Allison mentioned, there's just so much variation in those animals coming out of those cows that, um, yeah, we were getting the old genetics just multiplied aggressively. So um, today, today we we only do uh, virgin young heifers. Um, some heifers, most heifers, we start at nine months of age, and we'll go to about twelve months of age and uh, collect them a few times. Um, Sometimes I'll, I'll collect them again after they have been um, have confirmed pregnant. And we can do that up to about 120 to 130 days carrying calf. So uh, depending on the animal and what other donor candidates I have uh, in the herd, uh, we'll determine uh, which animals we use. So every other week we collect uh, oocytes, eggs off of uh, heifers and uh, make embryos. Uh, some are placed fresh, some are frozen and uh, placed at a later date. Um, so one interesting thing <clears throat> is, uh, you know, I, I like I like data, so I like comparing uh, financials. I'm I'm first and foremost a businessman, and so I like comparing uh, my financials against you know the others in top twenty five percent or whatever. And and uh, my vet meeting, uh, column is always way higher because of our IVF program. It's not a cheap program. Um, on average, that calf those calves cost me an extra three hundred fifty to four hundred dollars per head. To make so it is definitely an investment in my genetic strategy uh but one that i'm still confident is worth doing uh because we have not stopped doing it and we won't stop doing it so um but yeah we're 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 looking to to shorten that that generation interval and to get more of our animals from some of our best genetics any other questions about that brian uh can you just allude to how you feel that improves um, sustainability of both your operation and also environmentally? Sure. So again, we're, we're striving to produce, um, you know, create a more compact cow uh, with good, good components, good combined fat and protein, uh, good breeding, uh, DPR, uh, good health traits so that, uh, you know, we all like that, that invisible cow, that cow that just calves, gets bred, gets pregnant, milks, doesn't get mastitis, doesn't get lame. Um, you know, those are the cows you, you come across every once in a while at, at 150, 200,000, when they've made 150, 200,000 pounds of milk. And it's like, man, where did you come from? Uh, because you've never seen her. You've never really noticed that cow. She just kind of does her thing. She's not the relative value 140 or 150. She's usually a 110, 115, just kind of a, a good cow, a little above average that just does her thing day in and day out. So we're really focusing on creating more of those in our herd while at the same time uh, feeding fewer heifers. Um, so that's that's kind of part of our sustainability model is, is you know, we, we are producing more with less again. We're producing more milk uh, with fewer animals, um, you know, with enteric emissions and that sort of thing. And um, and we do have a digester now. So, you know, but we're you know, obviously we we want their cow. We want the cows to keep pooping as well. Uh, that's very important for the digester. So, um, um, and we need enough of them doing that every day. So, uh, yeah, it, we're, we're trying to do more with less all the time. Um, we're very aggressive in, in our beef breeding. Um, we haven't used conventional semen since 2017 now. So we only use sexed and, and beef. Um, 62% of our calves born are Angus Holstein crosses. And so, um, Again, you know, we're 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 stri always striving to uh, um, do more with less, and and we've been successful in doing that so far. We'll continue to we'll continue to strive to get better. Thank you, Simon. Um, so talking a little bit about that uh, sex and beef uh, semen usage and and how that has a a huge sustainability story behind it. Um, Allison, I know you're really involved in the beef industry. Can you talk a little bit about uh, dairymen and them creating um, beef crosses versus the traditional Holstein bull calf that was sold previously? Yeah, I think this is really a su sustainability story that's kind of escaped many people and it, it mm -hmm. kind of almost snuck up on everybody that doing exactly what Simon just alluded to is happening now and what used to I won't call it a waste product of the dairy industry, but but bull calves were not what we were after, um, you know, dairy bull calves. Um, and in fact, in some breeds, it's, it, it is almost hard to, to get a, anyone that will take them, Jersey bull calves particularly. 
they've taken the fact that you can use sex semen to get the replacement heifers you know you want and basically utilize those empty uteruses, for want of a better expression, um, to produce an F1 beef animal that is um, more efficient at getting to market weight um, and is a more desirable uh, market or product for that particular market. And so to me, it's it's kind of already taking a, a sustainable cow. I, I agree with the rep from Zuetis that said the dairy cow is a pretty sustainable girl. And now she's producing, in addition to all the milk she's producing, she's also producing a really valuable product for the beef industry. And dairy producers are getting paid more money for that animal, the same pregnancy, just different semen. And to me, it, that was an easy switch to make, but it, it was had to have genomics and sex semen to enable it to work. That's what I mean by this intersection between advanced reproductive technologies, genomics and biotechnology is really, really um, synergistically improving the sustainability of the dairy industry. Brian, can, are you utilizing beef semen and, and can you talk about your beef semen program? Yeah, so we are now um, similar to uh, Simon. We were a little bit later to the party, uh, if you will, but we are only utilizing uh, beef semen and sex semen um, as far as the mating decisions that we're making on the farm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, which is why Brian's in, in the chair he's in right now, what our percentage uh, and you know what the makeup is, but you know the the driving factor behind that was to maximize, you know, maximize revenue from an animal that we weren't going to keep anyway. And uh, Allison, I think it's uh, quite funny you brought up the Jersey bull calf. Um, I heard a, a story one time that, you know, dairyman goes out in the morning and has a, a pen of three bull calves by the side of the road and has a sign that says free. Then he goes off and does his daily chores. And then when he comes back, there's 10 bull calves there. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we really do have to, you know, in our business, we're very consumer centric and understanding what, what do the consumers want, right? And, and the consumers are not just the people that are buying products at the grocery store, but, you know, the beef industry is a, is a consumer of, uh, of the dairy industry, right? And, and the calves that we, that we put out there, and if we can make a better product for them and, and be rewarded for it, uh, like Simon said, you know, we are business people first. And um, that's very important to make a product that the market is demanding. Uh, so that's that's kind of why we decided to go with the, the beef on dairy uh, approach. And then obviously on the, the sex semen side of things, very similar to Simon's approach. We want to make sure that we're making more of the animals that we want and uh, less of the animals that we don't. Yeah, so just adding on to that, um, the uh, utilizing a sex and beef only program really allows you to also um, improve your selection intensity and create the heifers that, that you want. So we're now narrowing the pool of cows that we're deciding to put sex semen in to create that next generation. And um, then anybody else who we have decided is is not going to contribute to the next generation we're we're now making a really good product for the beef industry that um like brian said that now we are um, they are the consumer of our product and what i've seen in from the veterinary perspective is that um, those beef calves are really well taken care of so um, all the the dairies that i worked with um, have the same colostrum protocols as they um, for their heifers as they do those crossbred beef calves that, um, you know, I think in the past when you weren't really getting much of any money for them, it was pretty hard to justify them that uh, liquid gold of colostrum to um, those calves that, that weren't going to generate you any income. That's, that's pretty hard to do. So um, the health of those calves going into these calf operations is, is substantially better. And I think it's, it's, because they're rewarded and in turn that that just leads to a better sustainable calf that's gonna um, as, as Allison alluded to reach market weight a lot a lot quicker and more efficiently um, so kind of 
changing gears here a little bit. Um, what I want to now talk about is, is a more consumer focus. And um, so Brian, you um, have your own cheese company and Simon, you are the head of the board of directors for CDI. So both of you guys think about um, the consumer of our dairy products very extensively in, in your operations. And it probably drives decisions a little bit more on your operations than maybe some other dairymen. Um, can you talk about how you feel that your genomic selection has improved sustainability of your cheese operation, Brian? Well, I think, um, I think really what the, you know, the, the question continues to be is what, what is the consumer demanding? Um, and, and I think that in our experience and in our unique situation, um, the consumers are, are demanding first, first off, they want a very, very good product. They want something that tastes very good. Um, and, and thankfully we've been able to, to be successful at doing that. And now what's really starting to grow with consumers is they want to know where it comes from. They want to know how it was produced um, and, and by how, you know, the ingredients that are involved in making that product and also all of the environmental uh, implications uh, that are involved in, in producing food. Um, and I think that the dairy industry is doing a, a much, much better job now at telling that side of the story because it was being told by people that really didn't have much to do, if anything, with our, with our industry. And I think that's a, a little bit unfortunate that, you know, some of the practices that we were doing 30, 40 years ago continue to this day that are, that are very sustainable. Um, so in our cheese operation, you, you know, we are looking at how to reduce waste. We're looking at how to make a great product and we're looking at, you know, being very open and honest with the consumer about how we're doing it. So um, I think we've done a lot of things right for a long time. We're now, not now, but in the more recent future or, or past, I should say, we are really getting better at connecting with consumers and, and explaining to them why we do certain things. And then when they hear it from uh, producers like Simon and myself, you know, there's a level of, of trust there that come out to our operations if you want to see how we do things. And then once they, once they get their boots on the ground, they, they look around and they say, wow, it's pretty impressive. All of the different uh, operations and projects that you have going on in your farm and and, you know, our families live here and we're, we're in it every day. So um, I think it's a great story to be told and um, honored to be in the same company as uh, people like Simon and his family that are, that are doing a, a very good, very good job and, and um, you know, helping out the industry. Thanks, Brian. You want to add on to that, Simon? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we've heard it said so many times that that farmers are the ultimate environmentalists. That's the, we, we live and breathe it every day. Our families live out here. You know, we have six kids and, and we're hoping they want to come into the operation someday. And, and we've just started down that road this year with our, our oldest um, on one of our dairies. So um, we, anytime we talk about sustainability, we have to start with financial sustainability. It has to make financial sense for the operation. And, and we, as an industry, you know, we, we all operate under nutrient management plans and those actually help us do better, uh, you know, more profitably utilize the manure and everything that happens on the dairy. It, it's a biological cycle. You know, we're, we're growing crops, we're feeding those crops, to the cows, we're collecting the manure, we're collecting the gas from that manure. Then we use that water to irrigate the crops and fertilize the crops. And, and then we grow the next crop and do it all over again. And, and that's what a lot of people fail to realize is, is there's so much happening here and all the byproducts that we feed to our cows um, that otherwise used to go to landfills. Um, all these things are part of our environmental story. And, and as Brian said, we have to tell that story. Otherwise, someone else will tell it for us. And so it, it's the onus is on us to um, develop that story. And, and we at CDI are, are doing that, um, you know, with our new plant, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of different, different avenues for how to, uh, um, you know, get to carbon neutrality. That's kind of the buzzword 
you know, for now and probably for the next few decades. Uh, how do we how do we get there? And with a renewable natural gas, with solar, um, with nutrient management, you know, proper nutrient management, with with farming practices, with water efficiency, whether it's drip or or you know subsurface, whatever whatever the case may be, uh, there's a lot of different ways. Um, and they can, the, the opportunities continue to present themselves. So we've seen, you know, the last few days here is there's, there's more opportunity to do more and, uh, let's continue to explore those. And, and, uh, as you know, if we think we're doing a, a pretty good job today that we can probably still get better tomorrow and we need to continue to have that kind of attitude and, and, uh, and encourage, and you know, our industry to have that kind of attitude as well. Uh, thank you guys. Sorry, I was just looking at some questions that are popping in. So um, I'm going to go ahead and ask those questions. Then what I'm going to do is, is ask you guys to, to give just one final statement on um, what your feelings are with, with genetics and, and how that can improve our overall environmental impact. Um, so the first question is, can you comment on methane related thing involving high milk producing breed versus average milk producing breed? and about the microbes in these breeds. Um, so I think that what this, what this question is really asking, and maybe I'll, I'll send this one to um, Allison, but um, any, any idea on um, methane produced by high producing cows versus average producing cows? Yeah, so I think the important metric there is the emissions intensity. Um, and so the methane will be proportional to feed intake to some extent. And so if an animal eats a lot, then by definition, almost there'll be more methane. But if she's also producing twice as much milk, you kind of have to do use that denominator as what or uh, that as the numerator to um, actually look at what's the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of milk, because that's really the important thing. So, you know, a very small animal that doesn't eat much might not make much methane, which doesn't make much milk either. And so there's kind of a balance there that has to be taken into account. There is also genetic variability between animals within a breed, same size, um, in terms of methane production. And there are some, some groups that are working to try to select for animals that um, have lower um, emissions uh, relative to their neighbor that that's um, kind of doing the same thing at the same size as what they are. And so there, there is a little bit, I would argue, I guess, as a geneticist, that the, the thing we've done that's reduced the emissions intensity the most is actually conventional breeding. Conventional breeding is a pretty strong powerhouse, especially when you start adding on um, tools like genomic selection. And that really is what has driven the reduction in the emissions intensity of a, of a glass of milk. And so uh, there are other things you can do. The seaweed we heard about earlier, um, but I really think that it's important to front and center, it's been having a breeding objective and moving in that direction using the components of the breeders equation that'll reduce the emissions intensity the most. Thank you, Allison. And I, I, I think just to add on to that, the conventional breeding uh, discussion would be really having that um, breeding objective like Simon has and, and utilizing these technologies um, both IVF, OPU, and then also genomic selection. Um, so both Brian and, and Simon, you guys have a um, one minute pitch on, on how you feel genomics is, is a key part in our environmental footprint as a dairy operation. We'll start with, with Brian. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of, a lot of topics here today and, and, you know, the genetics being a very important part in sustainability. Um, I think we've all said it, you know, maybe in, in various ways today, but, but truly doing as much as we can, uh, producing as much wholesome and nutritious milk as we can with fewer inputs. Um, all of those inputs are going to have some some level of you know carbon intensity to them so if we can do a, a better job with less inputs um genetics plays such a huge role in that and simon and i have both covered the just the heifer population side of the equation but also um the progress that we're making on the cows that 
that we keep on the farm. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it there and let Simon, you know, take us home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I mean, it. as I listen to Brian, it's all about efficiency. It's, it's what we as businessmen st strive to, uh, to implement in our businesses is efficiency. And um, through genetics, through genomics, um, and breeding strategies and, and all the things we do with our, our animals, um, we are able to uh, gain more efficiency. Um, and, you know, coming back to genomics, like I said, a lot of people have, you know, why do you keep doing it? You got good cows. Why do you, why do you want to keep, you're, you're doing pretty good already. Why do you want to, what, how much more can you gain? Um, well, I don't know. We keep getting better every year. So why not keep trying to get better? That's kind of been my goal in life is trying to get better every day. So, um, but when it comes to, you know, if someone's not doing genomics and they want to start, they have to have a plan and there's not a right or a wrong way to do it, but they have to have a plan of either, you know, we're going to make extra heifers and sell the bottom end. We're going to implement a beef breeding strategy. Um, you know, we want to play some embryos, whatever the case may be. Uh, there's, there's not a right or a wrong way to do it. The only wrong way to do it is just to do it out of curiosity to find out, you know, how, as most of us did when we started, it was like, what do we have here? Uh, we were trying to figure that out. So, um, but we, we still had a plan that we were going to implement with that, with that data. So, um, have a plan. That's the biggest thing and sur surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Uh, that's, that's what I've done and it's worked out really well for me. Thank you, Simon. Um, Allison, last minute thoughts on that? Uh, I think there's some exciting traits coming into the indexes. And so the most recent net merit index out of um, USDA includes things like um, uh, feed intake or residual feed in intake or feed efficiency and also um, early first calving. Uh, and so I think that genomics gives you a handle on some of those more difficult to improve traits and that the indexes are going to get more sophisticated and will be going even faster in the right direction uh, when we have all of these traits incorporated. So I think we're not done yet. Uh, and I think genomics is going to continue to play a really important role in improving the sustainability of, of the dairy industry. Well, I just want to thank all the panelists on the discussion today. It's been it's been a great discussion. We've we've gone the the whole breadth of of environmental sustainability, and um, I think that this California Dairy Sustainability Summit has has really been um, enlightening as to some of these new technologies and the utilization of current technologies um, for our whole dairy industry to keep improving. Um, so that we can reach these these environmental goals. Leave, and I hope everyone enjoys the poster presentations coming up. <laughs>